Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I am Associate Director of the Institute. Um, through lectures, master classes, non-credit courses, and summer seminars, we work here at the Institute to try and make the Catholic intellectual tradition available and a living dialogue partner at the university for high school students and for our that we make available every week for our students through our non-credit course series. And we're now reaching um, even further audiences through our co-sponsors. This event is um, uh, made possible, uh, supported by um, the Collegium Institute, the Novo Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, the Beatrice Institute, the Harvard Catholic Center, and the Calvert House Catholic Center. You can help support our work and help continue to make these webinars free by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. You can also help spread the word of these events by sharing our emails and helping us to broadcast these events through social media. You can find us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. I'd also like to issue a special invitation um, to each of you viewing tonight to join us for, uh, for next Tuesday at 5 p.m a special event where Bernard McGinn, who helped kick off this series, will be joined by Wilhelmine Otten, who spoke for us last week for a conversation on apocalypticism in times of crisis. This lecture series will also continue next week with Kevin Hughes from Villanova um, for a lecture on Bonaventure. I'll now hand it over to Robert um, Porwall, who has helped to organize this series to both introduce our speaker and moderate tonight's event. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Michael. Indeed, as Michael said, our, uh, the, the series tonight, or the presentation tonight is part of the series, Reason and Wisdom in Medieval Christian Thought. The series offers a course of introductions uh, into the great Christian intellectual and spiritual tradition of the Middle, the Middle Ages, especially looking at the tension that existed between uh, the con more contemplative and the more rational or dialectical ways that medieval Christians sought the face of God. Uh, this is our sixth presentation. Past presentations can be found on YouTube. And as Michael said, Professor uh, Kevin Hughes will be speaking to us next week on St. Bonaventure. After that, Bernard McGinn will come back to speak on Meister Eckhart. And finally, the series will be concluded with Professor David Albertson on Nicholas of Cusa. At any time during the presentation, you can ask a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll have a moderated question and answer time at the end, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, let, let me now introduce our speaker, Professor Katie Bugish, comes to us from Notre Dame, where she teaches, uh, in, uh, teaches theology, liturgy, uh, and the experiences of medieval women, religious, and many other subjects. She holds professorships in the program of liberal studies, the Department of Theology, as well as, the, as, as well as a faculty fellow in the Medieval Institute. Uh, having just finished teaching herself, Julian of Norwich in, in Notre Dame classrooms, uh, we're very excited and very glad to have Professor Brugish here with us tonight. Uh, Professor, can I invite you now to start your, uh, your camera and, un and unmute yourself? There we go, wonderful. I'll hand the forum over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. So it is my great pleasure to speak virtually at the Lumen Christi Institute this evening about wisdom and knowledge in the writings of the late medieval English anchorite and theologian Julian of Norwich. First, I want to express my gratitude to Rob, Peter, and the other members of the Institute's staff who organized this event. The transition to Zoom classes, lectures, meetings, and hangouts has been a learning experience for all of us over these past few months. And Rob and Peter have done a remarkable job of making the transition from in-person lecture to webinar as seamless as possible. Second, I want to thank all of the members of the audience for taking time this evening to Zoom in to attend this lecture. I wish that we could have gathered in person, but I am thankful that this online platform has allowed many from across the country, including family, friends, colleagues, and students of mine to join us remotely. Our ability to connect virtually in this way is a great blessing during these difficult and uncertain times. 
As Rob mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the program, program of Liberal Studies, or PLS, at the University of Notre Dame. PLS is the university's great books program, encompassing the disciplines of history, literature, music, natural science, political science, philosophy, and theology. I teach the program's two theology tutorials on the Bible and the Christian theological traditions, as well as six seminars that cover the great books of mainly the Western intellectual tradition from Homer's Iliad to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I'm the latest addition to the faculty in PLS. I joined the program this past fall. And during my two semesters in PLS, I've had the privilege of teaching the Bible tutorial and seminar three, which covers the works from the medieval and early modern periods. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, Dante Alighieri's Commedia, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle, Miguel de Cervantes's Don Quixote, and much more. Typically, right before the midterm break, we read one of my favorite medieval theological texts, Julian of Norwich's Revelation of Love. I have a special devotion to Julian's writings because I nearly wrote my doctoral dissertation on them. But I was especially excited to read and discuss her revelation with my students in seminar because at the beginning of, this, of the academic year and our program's opening charge, one of my colleagues derided Julian's text as, quote, a patchwork of inelegant ravings and complaints about personal illnesses and visions and confided that he, quote, never looks forward to teaching Julian because students quickly run out of things to say about the text. And this is certainly no fault of their own. Needless to say, I left the opening charge very troubled. I worried that my students would read Julian's revelation in precisely the way that my colleague had described and that I would have to work a pedagogical miracle in order to make my students see and understand the beauty, rigor, and brilliance of Julian's theological insights. Quite fortunately, the students I had the privilege of teaching this year proved that my worries were completely unjustified. They were nothing like the students my colleague had caricatured. With admirable openness and determination, they wrestled with the answers Julian received about the questions of the who of God, the how of prayer, the what of sin, the why of suffering, and many other conundrums that racked her mind and tested her faith. Many of my students this semester especially came to find great consolation in the promise that God makes to Julian that, quote, he will make well all which is not well. We finished reading her revelation right before spring break, just over a week before Notre Dame decided to switch from in-person to online instruction in order to preserve the health and safety of the campus community from the spreading pandemic. When we reconvened as a seminar on Zoom, after spending nearly two weeks sheltering in place in our respective homes across the country, one of my students remarked that she now had a deeper understanding of and an appreciation for Julian's religious vocation as an anchorite and the physical isolation that inspired her theological writings. It is from my students' insightful observation that I take the theme of my remarks this evening, the wisdom of enclosure in Julian of Norwich's showings. The question of who Julian of Norwich was can only be answered with guesses and conjectures mainly because we do not know the name she was given at birth or the date of her death. Based on evidence gleaned from her writings, she was probably born in 1342 or three and grew up under affluent circumstances in or near Norwich, a city second in, in importance to London during the 13th and 14th centuries. She was between six and eight years old when the first wave of the Black Death swept through England and killed at least half, but potentially as much as 80% of Norwich's population. Outbreaks of the plague recurred regularly in the city until 1387. Given these experiences, which surely resulted in the deaths of Julian's family members, friends, and acquaintances, it is not at all surprising that the question of the why of suffering is A, 
if not the central concern of her theological reflections. But it is noteworthy that she claims to have desired the following three graces by the grace, three graces by the grace of God when she was young. First, a recollection of Christ's passion. Second, a bodily sickness. And three, three wounds of true contrition, loving compassion, and earnest longing for God. Julian's justification for her wish for the first grace is understandable. To her, it seemed that she had, quote, some feeling for the passion of Christ, but still she desired to have more by the grace of God. She wished that she had been at the time with Mary Magdalene and with the others who were Christ's lovers, so that she might have seen with her own eyes the passion which our Lord suffered for her, so that she might have suffered with him as others did who loved him. As a medievalist, Julian's desire to have a recollection of Christ's passion is not entirely surprising. By the time she was expressing this wish in the second half of the 14th century, guides to meditating on the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, both in Latin and in other European vernaculars, were gaining in popularity. To encourage their readers to imagine themselves at the time of Christ, these guides depicted an exquisite and sometimes horrific detail, the sights, sounds, and smells of stories recounted in the gospels and extra canonical texts. Such a guide may very well have directed Julian's first wish. However, her desire for the second grace, bodily sickness, does surprise me, especially now when so many people both in the United States and across the world are suffering and dying from COVID-19. But even Julian recognized how unusual her desire for this grace was. She writes, as to the second grace, there came into my mind with contrition, a free gift which I did not seek, a desire of my will to have by God's gift a bodily sickness. I wish that sickness to be so severe that it might seem mortal, that I might in it receive all the rights which Holy Church has to give me. Whilst I myself should think that I was dying and everyone who saw me would think the same. For I wanted no comfort from any human earthly life in that sickness. I wanted to have every kind of pain, bodily and spiritual, which I should have if I had died, every fear and, and temptations from devils, and every other kind of pain except the departure of the, of the spirit. I intended this because I wanted to be purged by God's mercy and afterwards to live more to his glory because of that sickness because I hoped that this would be to my reward when I should die, because I desire to be with my God and my creator. These two desires about the passion and the sickness which I desired from him were with a condition. For it seemed to me that this was not the ordinary practice of prayer. Therefore I said, Lord, you know what I want. If it be your will, then I have it, that I have it. And if it be not your will, Good Lord, do not be displeased, for I want nothing which you do not want. When I was young, I desired to have this sickness when I would be 30 years old. By Julian's telling, it was indeed God who moved, moved the desire of her will by a free gift to have a bodily sickness. But this desire was accompanied by the spirit of contrition, most likely of past sins, given her express wish of purgation by God's mercy so as to live more fully to the worship of God. Later, she also came to learn from God that bodily sickness teaches us the humility and meekness that allow us to acknowledge the greatness of God as our creator and the littleness of ourselves as, cre as created beings. But my present experience of living through, but thankfully not yet suffering from COVID-19 has led me to wonder whether a kind of survivor's guilt prompted Julian's desire for bodily sickness. I now can imagine well that recurring experiences of witnessing the suffering and dying of loved ones, acquaintances, and even strangers due to the outbreaks of the Black Death in Norwich affected Julian profoundly, leaving her to grapple with the question of why she was spared and others weren't. 
To answer this question, she would have tried to assess the worthiness of her own life, to weigh her good thoughts, words, and deeds against her bad ones. And no doubt, especially if she had judged herself against the merits of others, the bad would have outweighed the good, moving her to become contrite for her past sins and to seek a palpably visceral way to be purged of them. But I also think that her desire for bodily sickness was a radically loving expression of solidarity with those suffering and dying from the plague, much like God's taking on the frailty of human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. For her true compassion for others necessarily entailed a shared passion. Ultimately, it was God's will that Julian suffer in both body and spirit, because when she was 30 and a half years old, she was afflicted with a bodily sickness that left her bedridden for several days and nights, at times partially or completely paralyzed, and on three occasions so close to death that a priest was sent for to minister to her. During the second visitation from a priest, either on May 8th or 13th, 1373, he set a crucifix before her eyes to look at and take comfort in. While fixing her eyes on the face of the crucifix, her sight began to fail and everything in the room became dark except the image of the cross. Then the upper part of her body began to die until she could scarcely feel anything. She observed, my greatest pain was my shortness of breath and the ebbing of my life then truly I believed that I was at the point of death. And yet she did not die. In fact, suddenly all of her pain was taken away from her and she was healthy as ever as she was ever before. She was astonished by this change in her condition and believed that it was God's doing, but she felt ill at ease because she would have rather died. Then it came into her mind that she should wish for her body to be filled full of recollection and feeling of Christ's passion. She desired his pains to be her pains. She later insisted in this, I never wanted any bodily vision or any kind of revelation from God, but the compassion which I thought a loving soul could have for our Lord Jesus, who for love was willing to become a mortal man. I desired to suffer with him, living in my mortal body as God would give me grace. But after expressing the, this desire to suffer with Christ, she suddenly received the first of what would be 16 showings from God, beginning with a bodily vision of the blood running down Christ's face from the crown of thorns placed on his head. As you can see in the list of 16 showings provided on the slide, five of them, those highlighted in red, reveal scenes from Christ's passion. The other show, either bodily or spiritually, different theological truths about the nature of God, Christ, the Virgin Mary, the devil, and the human soul. Julian later reported that she received the first revelation at about four o'clock in the morning, and that the next 14 revelations were shown in, in succession until about three o'clock in the afternoon of that same day. Then her bodily sickness returned and left her so bereft of consolation that she came to doubt the revelation she had received as mere raving. Then while she was sleeping, she was violently attacked by the devil and his assault did not stop until she returned to what God had revealed to her, revealed to her and to the faith of the church and embraced them as one. And then on the following evening, she received the 16th and final revelation. According to Julian, in that revelation, God opened her spiritual eye and showed her her soul, which appeared to her as a city in the middle of which Jesus sits as both true God and true man. And when she contemplated this, showing with attention, God revealed these words to her. Know it well. It was no raving which you saw today but accept and believe it and hold firmly to it and comfort yourself with it and trust in it and you will not be overcome. 
And soon after Julian received these words, all was hidden and she saw no more. Julian's profession and state of life at the time she received the 16 showings are unknown. There is a possibility that she was a nun at the Benedictine Priory, of, Priory at Caro, located about a mile from the church of St. Julian's Conisford in Norwich, where she was later enclosed as an anchorite. On the slide, you can see photos of the remains and layout of the buildings of the Priory. And here is a map of Norwich in the 14th century that gives you a sense of the relative distances between Carrow Priory, St. Julian's Church, and the city center of Norwich. The possibility that Julian was first a Benedictine nun is strengthened by the fact that the anchor hold that she came to occupy was a gift of Carrow Priory. Most of the women in this community came from prominent local families and were well-educated just as Julian clearly was. Her reported response to the first revelation, Benedicite Dominus, bless Lord, nearly echoes the greeting used between Benedictine monks and nuns. Also during the sixth revelation, God thanks her for the service and travail of her youth, perhaps indicating that she was consecrated to God in childhood or early adulthood. Still, in recent year, years, there has been a lot of pressure in the scholarship on Julian to claim that she was a laywoman, perhaps married and a mother. References to mothering and pregnancy in her writings, as well as the presence of her own mother and an unnamed child at her sickbed have encouraged such speculation. Whatever Julian's profession and state of life at the time of the revelation, we do know that she had decided to become an anchorite at St. Julian's Church sometime before 1393 or four when she was 50 years old. Surviving wills attest that she spent at least two decades of her life in that cell. They also indicate that she had a significant local reputation and extensive and lofty religious and social connections. One of the most direct accounts of Julian's public reputation is found in the book of Marjorie Kemp, the other major visionary work by an English woman of the period. In an early chapter, the book recounts a trip Marjorie made to Julian to consult her about her own visionary experiences, perhaps in 1413 when Julian was 70. According to the book, Marjorie spent many days at Julian's cell communing in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Marjorie is said to have shown Julian, quote, the grace that God put in her soul of compunction, contrition, sweetness and devotion, compassion with holy meditations and high contemplation and many holy speeches and dalliances that our Lord spoke to her soul and many wonderful revelations which she showed to the anchoress to know if there was any deceit in them for the anchoress was an expert in such things and could give good counsel. The anchoress, hearing the marvelous goodness of our Lord, highly thanked God with all her heart for his visitation, counseling this creature to be obedient to the will of our Lord God and fulfill with all her might whatever he put in her soul, if it were not against the worship of God and profit of her fellow Christians. For, if it were, for if it were, then it was not the moving of a good spirit, but rather an evil spirit. The book then goes on to give Julian a well-informed speech about the need for Marjorie to avoid doubting the revelation she receives from trust by trusting the gifts the Holy Spirit sends. This Julian's insistence to Marjorie on implying a twofold litmus test to all spiritual experiences to make sure that they advance the worship of God and profit of fellow Christians accords well with Julian's own writings, as we will see. As an anchorite, Julian followed the ancient tradition of living as an independent vowed religious under the obedience of God alone, not an abbess or abbot. This tradition understood itself to embody the earliest form of religious profession, deriving from the fourth century desert hermits of Egypt. 
Many of the spiritual guides directing the anchoretic life in England during the Central and Late Middle Ages, such as the late 11th century Benedictine monk Gosselin of Saint-Bertin's Book of Consolation, or the mid 12th century Cistercian monk Aylred of Ravos on the institution of the enclosed, or the 13th century Ankaran Wissa, encourage anchorites to live lives of austere, solitary reflection in a physical desert akin to their religious found forebears. But anchorites actually lived in villages or cities. Their cells or anchor holds were attached to churches that were anything but isolated. They were very much public figures. Extant records attest that anchorites frequently ministered to and were ministered by the surrounding community. As the passage from the Book of Marjorie Kemp revealed, Julian was no exception. Marjorie was probably only one of many, who, one of many people who stopped by Julian's cell to receive spiritual guidance from her. You can imagine Julian as a late medieval Lucy from the Peanuts cartoon. Julian's cell was located in a busy neighborhood in one of England's largest cities. Norwich was a regional center in the, in the late Middle Ages. Commercially, it was linked to the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and the Baltic. And intellectually, it was linked through its mon monasteries and other institutions to Cambridge and Oxford universities. Julian would have entered her profession as an anchorite through a ceremony celebrated by a bishop in which he would have taken away her old name and given her a new one, um, new one, probably the name of her church's patron saint, Julian the Hospitaller. And while she was being walled into her cell, the bishop would have recited the office of the dead to mark her death to the world and burial in Christ. The two manuscript illuminations on the slide both taken from late medieval English pontificals, depict the ordo for the enclosure of a recluse. In the illumination at the top of the slide, you can see an anchorite entering her cell and a bishop standing outside of the door of it, pronouncing a blessing. In the illumination at the bottom, you can see an anchorite peering out from the window of her walled up cell and a bishop standing outside of it, pronouncing a blessing. The anchorite being bricked up in her cell by two stonemasons on this slide is Sister Bertkin, who at the age of 30 was enclosed as an anchorite in a cell attached to the city church of Utrecht, where she lived for the next 57 years until her death in 1514. After her death, several songs and hymns were found among her, among, among her belongings and published. This stone plaque was placed on the Martins Bridge in Utrecht to commemorate her life and literary contributions. Few anchor holds in England dating to the Middle Ages still survived intact today, but those that do, such as those pictured on the slide at Durham and Kings Lynn, offer rare glimpses into what the lives of medieval anchorites must have been like. One, of my, one, one feature of these anchor holds that I find fascinating is their squints, small windows or narrow peepholes in the cells that allowed the anchorites to see the main altars of the churches to which they were attached so that they could view the celebration of the mass, especially the elevation of the host during the consecration of the Eucharist. Quite unfortunately, Julian's anchor hold did not survive the dissolution of the monasteries by King Henry VIII in the late 1530s. At this time, at this time the Church of St. Julian's was stripped of its rood screen and statues, and the cell attached to it was demolished. By 1845, the church was in desperate need of repair. The rector at the time raised funds to restore the church but his plans for restoration were much criticized then and now. It underwent further repairs in the early 20th century, but it was destroyed during the Norwich Blitz of 1942. After World War II, funds were raised to restore the church. Now it appears much the way it did before its destruction, but a chapel featured on the slide was built in place of its long lost anchor hold. 
sometime after Julian received the 16 revelations in May of 1373, she composed written accounts of what had been shown to her. Two closely linked work, works in which she detailed her experience are still extant. Scholars refer to the first work as either the short text or a vision showed to a devout woman. The opening words to the rubric heading the sole manuscript witness to the work copied in the mid 15th century, no more than a generation after Julian's death. Um, an opening folio of this manuscript witness is featured on the slide. Julian composed the short text sometime between May of 1373 and the mid 1380s. It is the earliest writing in English that we can securely attribute to a woman author. In it, Julian presents herself mainly as a participant of the revelation she received, not as an interpreter of them. She recounts in vivid detail the scene at her sickbed, the progress of her bodily sickness, the 16 revelations, and her first reactions to them. She stays close to the historical present of the time when the revelations are said to have happened. Of this work, Nicholas Watson, a scholar, scholar and editor of Julian Short Text, has observed, a vision still labors under the weight of all it has wanted to say and for whatever reason cannot. Julian too recognized the insufficiency of this initial record of, her, of the revelations because sometime later, possibly beginning in the mid 1390s, she composed a longer account. Scholars refer to this second work as the long text or a revelation of love. So far in this presentation, I have been quoting passages from this account. The long text is a full scale expansion and revision of the short text. In it, Julian is no longer a participant, just a participant in her visions, but she is also a co-creator and rigorous interpreter of them. The long text is four times and four times the length of its predecessor, accounting in part for this dramatic transformation of the short text into the long text are two secondary revelations that Julian received. First, in 1388, 15 years after the initial revelations, she was finally taught their meaning. In the final chapter of the long text, she writes, and from the time that it was revealed, I desired many times to know in what was our Lord's meaning. And 15 years after or and more, I was answered in spiritual understanding. And it was said, what do you wish to know? What, what do you wish to know your Lord's meaning in this? Know it well, love was his meaning. Who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why does he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this, and you will know more of the same, but you will never know different without end. The second further revelation that Julian received pertained to an enigmatic parable concerning a Lord and a servant that she had left out of the short text. In chapter 51 of the long text, Julian admits that God had instructed her inwardly about the parable for 20 years, save three months after its initial revelation. Later in this same chapter, she explains how essential it was for her to understand the parable in order to comprehend all of the showings that had been revealed to her. Also in this marvelous example, I have teaching within me as it were the beginning of an ABC, whereby, whereby I may have some understanding of our Lord's meaning for the mysteries of the revelation are hidden in it, even though all the showings are full of mysteries. I must confess that Julian's alphabet metaphor has taken on a whole new meaning for me now that I'm a mother of a toddler. And though I still think that Julian was most likely a Benedictine nun at Caro Priory before she became an anchorite, I have a better appreciation for the arguments scholars have made in favor of claiming a lay status for her at the time of her revelations. Given what she says about the duration of the inward teaching about the parable of the Lord and the servant that she received, she must have started to compose the long text sometime after 1393. 
but she may have continued to work on it for the rest of her life. Julian most certainly was an anchorite which she composed the long text. And in what remains of my presentation this evening, I want to focus on the difference that this time of enclosure made on the very composition of her final account of the revelation she received. Specifically, I will attend to the ways she accommodated her fellow Christians, the intended audience of her book and the revelation's meaning. Already in the short text, Julian stresses the general meaning of her writings in a number of passages. For example, at the end of the first showing, she explains, everything that I say about myself, I mean to apply to all my fellow Christians, for I am taught that this is what our Lord intends in this spiritual revelation. Julian repeats such admissions of a broader application of the showings God revealed to her in the long text but the authorial self who makes these admissions is radically different than the one who speaks in the short text. Indeed, Julian transformed the I that appears in the short text into one in which God and all her fellow Christians could identify with. Through years of enclosure and a space in which she could continue meditating on Christ's passion, ruminating on the showing she received, and contemplating the God who always remained both revealed and hidden, Julian worked to effect this transformation of self so that she could fashion her book into a kind of anchor hold in which all could safely dwell. Julian's entrance into her anchor hold, her burial in the tomb of her cell, sacramentally affected a death to self. Her religious profession as an anchorite can be profitably read as her acceptance of Christ's invitation to enter into and dwell within the open wound in his side, which was revealed in the 10th showing. With a kindly countenance, our good Lord looked into his side and he gazed with joy. And with sweet regard, he drew his creatures understanding into his side by the same wound. And there he revealed a fair and delectable place, large enough for all mankind that will be saved and will rest in peace and love. Julian did indeed find rest in Christ's side, but it was a fleeting peace. Although she more fully entered into the reality of true life in Christ through her entrance into her anchor hold, her spiritual death could not grant her either total protection against sin or an unfailing experience of God's presence. And the 13th showing, she was told that she would do nothing at all but sin. But she was also told that her sin would not impede the operation of God's goodness. Her status as an anchorite and her physical situation within her cell could not help her to transcend her own sinful nature. She would still be susceptible to the same temptations that her fellow Christians fall prey to in the world outside her cell. Thus, because she was still so utterly human, God showing her that she should sin could be taken singularly to herself. And indeed, she admits to doing just that initially. But sometime between writing the short, short text and the long text, she came to learn that this revelation was interpreted more fittingly in the following way. But by all the gracious comfort that follows, as you will see, I was taught to apply it to all my fellow Christians, to all in general and not to any in particular. Though our Lord showed me that I should, should sin, by me, alone is by me alone is understood all. The showings Julian received were to serve as a mirror for others in the world. She would help them to understand more fully their present condition to lift back the veil on their sinful unreality. To witness to her solidarity with the unenclosed, she admits several times in the long text that she has acutely felt God's absence. In her discussion of prayer in the 14th showing, Julian offers a word of comfort. But still, our trust in God is often not complete, because we are not sure that God hears us, as we think, 
because of our unworthiness and because we feel nothing at all. For often we are as barren and dry after our prayers as we were before. But she tells her readers not to be distressed if they feel this way, because she has experienced this in herself. Julian's entrance into her anchor hold established the necessary physical and imaginative space in which she could be stripped of sinful egoism to speak a revelation that was not her own for the benefit of all her fellow Christians. It is quite telling of Julian's maturation as a writer that in the transformation of her short text into the long text, her authorial eye was more thoroughly excised from her communication of God's showings. In nearly every chapter of the long text, Julian removed the prepositional phrase to me after any mention of God showing, answering, or speaking to her. Even more noticeable are the excisions of all the references to Julian as a woman. For example, in the short text, near the end of her exposition of the first showing, she writes, God forbid that you should say or assume that I am a teacher, for this is not and never was my intention. For I am a woman, uneducated, feeble, and frail, but I know very well that what I am saying I have received by the revelation of him who is the sovereign teacher. But it is truly love which moves me to tell it to you. For I want God to be known and my fellow Christians to prosper, as I hope to prosper myself, by hating sin more and loving God more. But because I'm a, I am a woman, Ought I therefore to believe that I should not tell you of the goodness of God, when I saw at the same time that this is his will that it be known? You will see clearly in what follows, if it be well and truly accepted. Then will you soon forget me, who am a wretch, and do this, so that I am no hindrance to you, and you will contemplate Jesus, who is every man's teacher." Julian removed this entire passage when she transformed the short text into the long text. This editorial decision likely reflects her growing confidence as a woman writer about the mysteries of God, as many scholars have suggested. But I think that we also need to take her at her word. She wants to be forgotten as the writer of the book so that her readers focus on God alone in their contemplation. And what more effective way is there for her to do that than to efface herself completely from the text? Julian's authorial presence is felt only insofar as what she experienced is what God hopes for all of her readers to experience. And what she came to know to be true of God is what God hopes for all of her readers to know to be true of God. She claims that she is not revealing anything new. She repeatedly insists that she is only communicating what the church holds to be true. Still, she does seek to acquaint her readers with who they truly are, the self that they cannot or refuse to see because of their sinful blindness. In her exposition of the 13th showing, which was given in response to her question of why God does not prevent sin, she laments, the use of our reason is now so blind, so low, and so simple that we cannot know the high, marvelous wisdom, the might, and the goodness of the Blessed Trinity. Julian helps her readers to know themselves truly in God. Thus, to ask the question of why Julian received these showings or why any person receives a special revelation from God rather than I or someone else is to miss the point. By entering a physical space and an authorial voice that was utterly not her own, she became her fellow Christian. Indeed, so effectively had she entered into God's revelation that if her readers truly enter into her text, they realize that they are reading their own story. Julian's long text is fundamentally and necess necessarily 
a performance of death to self, or more truly, a recovery of self. It spirals forward, forward with greater virtuosity as the woman whom Julian would have recognized prior to her spiritual death increasingly disappears from the text as her story is told ever more seamlessly within gods and therefore her readers. By her own admission, her performance was neither perfect nor complete. By the time that she wrote her long text, she continued to struggle with the eye of her sinful self and the eye of her true self in God that enclosed all of her fellow Christians. For this reason, the final chapter of her long text opens with the following confession. This book is begun by God's gift and his grace, but it is not yet performed as to my sight. Her use of the possessive adjective re reveals, not unconsciously to her, I believe, that she had not yet fully written herself into God's story. She was still holding on to vestiges, however trace, of her old authorial eye. But Julian's candid and rather surprising admission of her own limitations as a translator of God's revelations could and maybe should be read differently. Here, at the end of her long text, her readers finally see her speak from her true eye, her eye grounded in the narrative of God. And from the vantage point of this eye, she realized that this side of death, she would never be able to tell God's story fully and thus perform the theological task at hand completely. She performed it as well as she could and left off when she, could, when she had gone as far as she was able. And she never ceased to hope that someone else would carry on the task from where she had left off to lead readers deeper into the mysteries of the love of God. After becoming an anchorite, Julian neither dwelled within a space that she sought to possess, nor wrote the book that arose out of that space, at least ultimately as an autonomous self, that did not recognize its inextricable connection with others. We may ne never know the circumstances surrounding her entrance into her anchor hold, but we do know that while she lived within it, she sought to find her true identity in God. To do so, she stripped herself of her old physical and narratorial trappings in order to put on her new self, her true self in Christ the very spiritual showing given to her within the first revelation. At the same time, I saw this sight of the bleed of, saw this sight of the head bleeding. Our good Lord showed a spiritual sight of his homely loving. I saw that he is to us everything that is good and comfortable to our help. He is our clothing that for love wraps us and winds about us embraces us and wholly encloses us, hangs about us for tender love, that he may never leave us. Julian did not enter her cell in order to find a story of her own to tell, but in order to find a story in which she could be more truly told, a theology. She ultimately did find this theology, but she learned that, was, that this was not she, but she learned that not only was she meant to be told by it, but all of her fellow Christians too. Thus, she created a textual anchor hold in which all of her readers could dwell to, to discover their true selves in God. And at the end, she invited her readers to enter in and continue working on the book that is not yet performed as to her sight. To conclude my remarks this evening, I want to leave you with a passage from Julian's long text that has given me great hope and comfort during these difficult and uncertain times. It can be found in her exposition of the 16th showing. And these words, you will not be overcome, were said very insistently and strongly for certainty and strength against every tribulation which may come. He did not say, you will not be troubled, you will not be wearied, you will not be distressed. But he said, 
you will not be overcome. God wants us to pay attention to these words and always to be strong and faithful trust in well and in woe, for he loves us and delights in us. And so he wishes us to love him and delight in him and trust greatly in him and all will be well. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to receiving and responding to your questions. All right, let's, I'm trying to get my, oh, good. Maybe I'll just explain really quick, Robert. I know that some of you in the audience may be interested in further reading suggestions. And so on your screen from left to right, um, a modern English translation of Julian showings by Western Christian um, classics. And then the next one to the left is a, a wonderful edition of the Middle English text, both the short text and the long text. And then one of my favorite theological expositions of Julian showings by Dennis Turner, um, Julian of Norwich theologian. And for those of you who are more interested in maybe reading something of a more fictional bent, um, Robin Codwalder's um, The Anchoress is about um, a 14th century um, anchoress that's really fascinating. Tremendous. Thank you so much for this really uh, substantive and very insightful uh, 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 person and text. It's amazing. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, the, sort of the, the, the logistics of of Julian's counterintuitive life. Um, we saw some pictures of that. How, how big would you say those, the, the anchor hole, hole might be? Oh, I mean, most dimensions are somewhere about nine by 11 feet. I mean, they're, they're usually not very big. Um, so, I mean, probably no, more, no larger than the room that I'm actually in right now, more often than not, if you get a sense wow. of the dimensions of the space that I'm in. Wow. And then, so she, it would also she would also be depending in some way on on people outside her, or how how would yeah she receive food and water and things. So there would have been a window or two that would have opened out onto the streets of Norwich, and so people would have been able to pass food and water directly to her. And so, I mean, this is a, a point that I definitely wanted to stress within my lecture is that these are very much pe public figures and people would stop by the windows mm -hmm. of anchorites to have conversations with them. In fact, many of the guides to anchor anchorites actually encourage them not to be town gossips because this seems to have actually been a problem for many anchorites. <laughs> and, and interestingly, so I mean, so food and water would have been passed, but also potentially books as well. So a very interesting guide for anchorites that dates to the late 11th century that I mentioned in my lecture by Gosselin of Saint Bertin, the Book of Consolation, actually discusses how books could even be propped up sort of against the, the windows, like the grills of the windows so that anchorites could read books from there. Um, and, and he actually suggested this as a really good way to, to extend her library if she wasn't able to afford books herself. Mm. So I think there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that definitely that Julian was very well read and educated before she entered the, her anchorite cell but also that she would have continued reading works while she was in her cell. So that's, that's fascinating. And we, I want to come to the, some of the influence, the theological tradition in which she stands. But as far as the spiritual vocation, um, uh, we have two questions from Hans that are a little bit similar on this, this, this question. Hans asks, is it likely that a bishop would have approved in closing an anchorite who is not in some sense already proven by a life as a religious uh, uh, as of course, I think we, we saw in an earlier presentation, as you were alluding to, uh, that sort of anchorite vocation is, is, comes at the end of, of, a, of a spiritual life, does it not? What, how would you respond to this question? It's a great question, Robert. And so, as you mentioned, kind of at the beginning of your introductory remarks, my own scholarship focuses on the liturgical practices of Benedictine nuns. And mm -hmm. for those in the audience who are familiar with the Benedictine rule, St. Benedict does talk about sort of the anchoritic or eremitic life sort of being sort of the sort of more perfect form of religious practice that one could sort of finally sort of ascend to after a time spent in more sort of chenobitic or communal forms of monastic life. But what's interesting is that, you know, sort of as this 
practice of anchoritic life sort of takes off within England, but also on the continent as well. You sort of see a kind of separation from monastic life and anchoritic life. So it's not necessarily that a Benedictine monk or nun or another vowed religious would necessarily progress from communal life to an anchoritic life. There, there are multiple examples of people becoming anchorites straight away, and sometimes even at very young, at a very young age. So that Sister Birkin, whose pl stone plaque I showed on the one slide, we know that she actually was not a nun prior to entering her anchoritic cell. Um, and so, so it's a great question um, that that Michael was asking about whether or not a bishop would actually. Um, you know, make sure someone was a sort of proven character or, you know, had progressed far enough in, in the religious life in order to be an anchorite. Um, more often than not, it actually depended on whether or not the anchorite had sufficient funds in terms of her own personal wealth or through the donations of others in, in order to be able to sustain herself. So that was actually the primary concern for the bishop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's tremendous. And so, uh, Julian, in her previous life or in her cell or through the window, would have been would have been reading, continuing in prayer. Uh, uh, is, is and, and one of our, I, I'm I'm guessing, and uh, one of our attendees asks about the what what she might have read or been familiar with. Uh, Jeanette asks, uh, did Julian know of the writings of of Rosalind, of Abelard, of some of the scholastics like Occam and Scotus? I might also ask, maybe, maybe um, did Thomas or Augustine, or Thomas Aquinas or Augustine, figure into Julian's formation? So we don't know, and then there has been so much speculation about Julian's theological influences. Clearly, she was very familiar with the scriptures and sometimes is able to quote nearly verbatim from the scriptures. Um, but as far as sort of other um, influences from the theological tradition. There are lots of question marks. So there were, were was both a Dominican and Franciscan and Carmelite um, friaries that were located within Norwich. And there's been a lot of thought, and I think it's not completely unfounded to think that there but it would have been a lot of books passed to Julian Cell through those other religious communities within Norwich. And so maybe she would have had access to Thomas's writings or, or others. And also, as I mentioned in my talk, Norwich had really close connections with both Cambridge and Oxford universities. And so I think there's good reason to think that, um, that these ideas would have also flowed along with other sort of economic goods too, um, but we don't know. I, I like to think though, that if there's anyone that would have influenced Julian's writings, it would have been Augustine, um, mm -hmm. especially what she has to say about knowledge of the self and knowledge of God. And often says that it's, at one point she has this very striking passage where she says that it's easier to know God than it is to know your own soul. And it of course makes me think of Augustine's passage thinking that, you know, you know, you were within me and I was without, you know, I was outside myself. And, and so I, I hear a lot of Augustine in the background of Julian's writings, but, but Dennis Turner has made a really interesting case for thinking that potentially Thomas Aquinas also was a, a great influence on the way that Julian thought about the, the nature of sin, um, especially mm -hmm. thinking about sin as behovely, to use her words. And um, mm -hmm. Dennis has made a really interesting argument to say that we could translate that Middle English term behovely um, with the Latin word convenience, a kind of fittingness. Um, but he, he reads Julian and Thomas alongside each other in that book that I recommended. Uh, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Uh, in your presentation, you, you stressed about compassion, co-suffering, and the, the relationship of Christ to Julian and, and all of us in, in this relationship of suffering. One of our attendees, Jim, asks about this, about this relationship of suffering. And Jim asks, what would Julian respond to the question of how we can reconcile suffering and a loving God? Would her perspective on this question be unique for a theologian of her time? It is. I mean, in many ways it is. Question, and, yeah, and, and I would tell Jim, definitely read Julian Schilling's because this is precisely the problem that she is wrestling with, is that she cannot square her experience of suffering in the world with this revelation that God is love. And then she, you know, 
can't square the circle. And so that is the, the, basically that paradox is precisely what drives the entirety of the revelation. And, and I think Julian's answer in many ways is unique. I mean, in the sense that this is the first time that actually, at least from the records that are still extant, the first time that a, a woman theologian has tackled that question. Um, but it's certainly definitely within the, the tradition of the Catholic church and thinking about, you know, Augustine and Thomas and others. Um, but yes, I, I highly recommend it. it's a really beautiful answer that she ultimately is given, which is, I mean, she can't, she can't reconcile the paradox. The paradox is never fully um, resolved. Um, and, and she's told that it actually won't be resolved until she mm -hmm. reaches heaven, but still she's given great consolation about how she can sort of endure and suffering in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and also then to, to communicate that message of comfort to others. So Jim, yes, absolutely you need to read it. Thank you. Um, and, and then this, this question of co-suffering as well, Michael asked the question about whether maybe we have lost something about this. Uh, Michael asks, you spoke about Julian's desire to suffer with Christ and the medieval notions of, of this. Could you talk a little bit more about this medieval development of this notion? Also, whether you think the modern understanding of compassion has lost some of this sense of co-passion or co-suffering. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, I mean, it's interesting to look at the development of compassion over the course of the Middle Ages. And, and actually, I would recommend Rachel Fulton Brown's book on sort of looking at the development of the passion, sort of visual and narrative depictions of Christ's passion, especially in the central Middle Ages. Because as she rightly notes, you know, from the Carolingian period to the, the sort of central and later Middle Ages, you see a dramatic change in the representation of Christ on the crucifix from sort of a Christus victor that's sort of this you know, unbroken body on the, on the cross that is sort of triumphant over death to a depiction of Christ's body on the crucifix that's very much broken and clearly suffering. Um, and along with this, we see a rise in devotion to Mary as well, because Mary was believed to have been sort of the one who most perfectly suffered with Christ that a, you know, a sword her soul shall pierce too. And, and so it's interesting to see that then Mary becomes the model for compassion along with others whom Julian mentions in her text like Mary Magdalene and also the beloved disciple and, and others. Um, and so, yes, I mean, this idea of suffering with, it was not just supposed to be sort of limited to the mind, but also would take on more physical forms as well. And, and for Julian, I mean, that was part of the prayer for bodily sickness too, mm -hmm. is that I think she, she wanted to have a better understanding of what Christ suffered. And she felt that the only way to do that was actually physically suffering as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think we have lost something of that understanding of compassion today. I mean, to get back to sort of the Latin root of that term, like truly a suffering with. Um, and not that I'm necessarily advocating that anyone pray for a, a bodily sickness now, especially during these really difficult times. But I think it is the most radical form of empathy. Um, right. You know, and, and you can never truly know the suffering of another, really, unless you've experienced it too. Um, and and so, I don't know, I, mean, I think it's something that we, we need to think about more. And, and I think within our contemporary theology, I think it is a good moment now, given everything that's happening in the world, to maybe to develop a new theology of compassion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, th this, is, this is now coming to, maybe we'll come back to some of these themes in a minute. But that we, there, there is a couple of questions about uh, Julian's uh, ramifications, not ramifications, but the ripples that came out of her, how, the, how well she was known, how her text survived. Uh, did she did she send a, a copy of her text to to her bishop, or how did how did people come to know about the showings? And how yeah, did they? Like, <laughs> wow. So 
at least initially, we have no idea how the text ended up circulating outside of her cell. Um, the one slide that I showed with the image of the opening folio to the short text survives in a mid 15th century manuscript that is now held in the British Library. And that manuscript copy most likely was produced by a Carthusian charter house. And, and this is not at all surprising given what we know about Carthusians during the Middle Ages, they understood their primary vocation to be preaching with their hands, that is like serving as scribes of texts and making sure that there were fair copies of them to circulate. But that's striking though. So that means that a Carthusian charter house had a copy of Julian's short text, which again suggests that her work was beginning to circulate. And, and certainly her reputation was known by about 1413, at least, you know, so much so that you know Marjorie Kemp came to visit her to seek her out as a spiritual guide. And so one has to wonder whether her text was already circulating even at that point, but we don't know. Again, the only copy of that short text that we have it dates to the mid 15th century, about a generation after Julian died. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the long text goes, the earliest extant copies of the long text that still survive date to the 17th century. And interestingly, those copies, we can trace the provenance of them to two French Benedictine convents in actually in northern France in Cambrai and then also outside of Paris. And interestingly, the one that was in Cambrai was founded by the great great granddaughter of Thomas More, Gertrude More. And it seems clear that the spiritual advisor to that community, Augustin Baker, saw that and believed that Julian was you know, a, a good source for instruction on contemplation. And so brought this text from England to Northern France for this community to possess. And it's amazing because in the extant writings of those women that were in that community, we see them engaging with Julian's text and it's fascinating to see the insights that they ended up gleaning from her text. And so, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, some scholars, you know, I have thought that, you know, this, you know, given how um, few copies that we have of Julian's text that this must have mean that, you know, she didn't, that she wasn't well read or well known. Um, but the only thing that I'll say to that is that this is true for most medieval women writers, that their texts survive by a hair's breadth. And that doesn't mean that they weren't popular or well-known in their own days. It's just, in many ways, they, they, they lack the kind of institutional um, support that they would need for their works to be preserved and copied in perpetuity. I mean, they didn't have a sort of a band of Dominican friars to continue copying and studying Thomas, like, you know, copying like Julian's text, like Thomas's Summa, for example. And so I think it's remarkable that we have as many copies as we do of Julian's text. And I think there's enough historical evidence to suggest that it was, it, you know, had disseminated much more widely than what the manuscript evidence now shows. Thank you. Um, uh, one, maybe one last question uh, before we, we, we sign off. And there's a lot of questions about uh, uh, how, how Christians can uh, engage with Julian now, as you were saying, and so eloquently, it, the text itself becomes a kind of an anchor hold for us. Uh, Stephen, one of our inten uh, attendees asks about the present, uh, sort of circling around to how, how the presentation began, our current circumstances in Julian. Stephen asks, does Julian or do other anchorites write about the deprivations of enclosure and how she or God makes them spiritually profitable. What connections might you draw to the contemporary moment and those who are enclosed, perhaps self-quarantining after a diagnosis of COVID-19? It's a really wonderful question that Stephen's asking. And what I find so beautiful about Julian's text is that there's very little that she's not willing to admit about her own struggles in the faith, but I think struggles that arose out of her experience of being enclosed and that at times she was tempted to despair and, and to doubt everything that had been revealed to her. And, and, and in those moments, God continued to speak to her and speak words of great comfort. And, and I think those words that were spoken to Julian, I think can be profitably read right now. And that's, and I, and I, but I would think, I would think that Julian wouldn't say, well, that's not going to necessarily completely 
dispel the feelings that we have or to dismiss them as somehow unimportant. I mean, I think she was all too aware of the human experience, you know, the highs and the lows of it. Um, and I think she has great empathy for those who are, are experiencing quite a bit of suffering. And, and so I think reading Julian now, you know, and as I mentioned in my talk, I had the, the pleasure of reading it again with my students in seminar and then rereading it again in preparation for this lecture. And so much ended up jumping out at me in new ways because of this experience that, that we've had right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in a way that I had not previously was to, to read the text with an eye to Julian's own experience of enduring waves of the Black Death sweeping through Norwich um, and, and wondering what that must have been like for her and, 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 and the real fear that I'm sure she, she felt um, even while she was in her cell, because even by the time she would have entered her cell, most likely those waves of the Black Death that were sweeping through Norwich in the, in the 14th century had abated by then, but still I'm sure there was great fear that it somehow would suddenly come back. Um, and, and so I think Julian has much to say to us right now. But I think the other thing that I want to emphasize as well is that I think Julian never turned so wholly inward on herself that she forgot others. And somehow this experience of solitude for her ended up realizing how deeply interconnected she was with everyone, everything, all created things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is my great hope, I think, for myself right now is even though you know, we are practicing physical distancing and we're sheltering in place that I remain especially mindful of those who are not as privileged as I am to be able to shelter in place, who are out in the world working, um, you know, people that are driving buses and delivering mail and working as nurses and doctors and all the rest. And, and I'm sure Julian felt the same thing, seeing those who were busy about their work, especially those that were delivering her food to her cell is to always be mindful of those who, who cannot be enclosed. Hmm. We, we have many more questions. Uh, I'm, thank you all for all the attendees. Thank you all for these great questions. Uh, and uh, one more, Michael, before we go. <laughs> We've had several folks uh, perhaps looking at uh, our, our photos or, or other iconography uh, appertaining to Julian's feast day, which we just celebrated uh, yesterday. Uh, notice that there's a cat oftentimes depicted with, with Julian. Do you have any insight into why a cat might show up as, as a companion with, with Julian, St. Julian? I have no idea how the cat emerged, but I do, have, I do know who probably either has an answer to that or maybe actually the, the person behind the fact that there are these cats that appear in the iconography of Julian. It would be Barbara Newman, the wonderful medievalist at Northwestern University who has a great love for cats and a great love for Julian of Norwich. And so I always think that it must be Barbara who's behind this iconography because I don't think she would want to have it any other way. But right. that's, I don't know for certain how those cats ended up emerging. Maybe it's just the idea that most people who live alone have cats Cats. But I, I think that's oh. that's maybe is not fair to but either. There's many people that. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. That's it's a fascinating thing, uh, yeah. Professor. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's been wonderful. It was and my pleasure. Thank you, indeed, Professor Bukish. I want to I want to thank you for um, this timely uh, presentation, not only with the memorial feast the day yesterday, um, but also because of the important wisdom uh, that Julian can bring to us for this current moment. Um, and with that in mind, I also want to continue to extend an invitation to you to join us next week for our special event on apocalypticism in times of crisis with Bernard McGinn and Wilhelmine Otten. And I'd also invite you at this time to support our work at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, you can help make these webinars possible. Thank you so much. <laughs>